and welcome to this Ash Wednesday service. Uh, the beginning of Lent, when we walk with our Savior Jesus Christ on the way to Calvary's cross. Just a couple of preliminary announcements. If you're worshiping with us virtually, please send me a text message or an email. That information is useful to me. I should, I should have mentioned first, however, that the food tonight at the potluck was unbelievable. And I look for the same thing to happen next Wednesday night. So come for the food, but stay for the word. Uh, next Wednesday night, 6 o'clock, we'll worship once again. Potluck at 6, worship at 7. But then regarding tonight's service, it's here in your worship folder. It includes the imposition of ashes. Is that something you desire? That imposition of ashes is for any baptized Christian. Parents at the discretion of your children. Uh, uh, children at the discretion of your parents. <laughs> Also, we'll celebrate the Lord's Supper and our congregation practices member communion. So we ask that only those who are members of our congregation or members of a congregation in affiliation with ours, Wisconsin Sin, would come forward for the Lord's Supper. We hope you understand. If you have questions about our communion practice, I'm available after worship. May the Lord bless our worship together tonight. mercy on me, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash away all my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are proved right when you speak and justified when you judge. Surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me. Surely you desire truth in the inner parts. You teach me wisdom in the inmost place. Cleanse me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will turn back to you. Save me from blood guilt, O God, the God who saves me, and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. You do not delight in sacrifice, or I would bring it. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then there will be righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings to delight you. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Brothers and sisters in Christ, God created us to know joy in communion with him, to love all humanity, and to live in harmony with all creation. But sin separates us from God, our neighbors, and creation. And so we do not enjoy the life our creator intended for us. By our sin, we grieve our Father who, delights, who does not desire us to come under his judgment, but to turn to him and live. Therefore, God in his mercy has sent our Lord Jesus Christ to take our place under the law, to suffer for us, and to die the death we deserve. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. During the 40 days of Lent, we fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of God. The time of Lent reminds us that to know Christ and the power of his resurrection, we must also know the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. As disciples of the Lord Jesus, we are called to struggle against everything that leads us away from love of God and neighbor. I invite you, therefore, to confess your sins. Ask our Father for forgiveness 
and commit yourselves to this struggle. Let us be silent. Let us be still. Let us pause now for a time of reflection and self-examination. Most holy and merciful Father, we confess to you and to one another that we have sinned by our own fault, by our own grievous fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We have not forgiven others as we have been forgiven. Have mercy on us, Lord. We have been deaf to your call to serve as Christ served us. We have not been true to the mind of Christ. We have grieved the Holy Spirit. Have mercy on us, Lord. We confess to you, Lord, all our past unfaithfulness, the pride, hypocrisy, and impatience in our lives. We confess to you, O Lord our self-indulgent appetites and ways, our manipulation of other people. We confess to you, O Lord, our anger when our selfish aims are denied and our envy of those more fortunate than ourselves. We confess to you, O Lord, our love of worldly goods and comforts and our dishonesty in daily life and work. We confess to you, O Lord, our negligence in worship and prayer, and our failure to show the faith that is in us, we confess to you, O Lord. Forgive us, Lord, for the wrongs we have done, for our blindness to human need and suffering, and our indifference to injustice and cruelty. Forgive us, O Lord, for all false judgments, for uncharitable thoughts towards others, and for our prejudice and contempt for those who differ from us. Lord, forgive us, O oh Lord, for what we think or say or do that is at variance with your will. Forgive us, O oh Lord. Restore us, good Lord, and let your anger depart from us. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. Please step forward.
<coughs> Accomplish in us, O oh God, the work of your salvation, that we may show forth your glory in the world. By the cross and suffering of your Son, O oh Lord, bring us with all your saints to the joy of his resurrection. Almighty God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, does not desire the death of sinners, but rather that they turn from their wickedness and live. Therefore, I forgive all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We continue with the singing of the next hymn. repenting of their sin, and trusting in him for forgiveness. <clears throat> Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and mourning. Rend your heart and not your garments. 
Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love, and he relents from sending calamity. Who knows? He may turn and relent and leave behind a blessing, grain offerings and drink offerings from, from the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, declare a holy fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, consecrate the assembly, bring together the elders, gather the children, those nursing at the breast. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Let the priests who minister before the Lord weep between the portico and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, Lord. Do not make your inheritance an object of scorn, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? Then the Lord was jealous for his land and took pity on his people. The Lord replied to them, I am sending you grain, new wine, and olive oil, enough to satisfy you fully. Never again will I make you an object of scorn to the nations. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Ash Wednesday second reading is from St. John's uh, Revelation chapter 3. And when once again we hear God calling his people to rend their hearts, to make him first in their lives, to listen to his word. To the angel of the church in Sardis write, These are the words of him who holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your deeds. You have a reputation of being alive, but you are dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains and is about to die. For I have found your deeds unfinished in the sight of my God. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Hold it fast and repent. But if you do not wake up, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what time I will come to you. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Glory, praise, and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Turn away from all your offenses, declares the Sovereign Lord. I take no pleasure in the death of anyone. Repent and live. Glory, praise, and honor to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please stand for the Ash Wednesday Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, chapter 12. The parable of the rich fool. Taking no thought for the, the life after this one. Instead, building barns, gathering grain. The Lord calls us to be wary of the time, to repent while we still have it. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Jesus replied, Man, who appointed me a judge or an arbiter between you? Then he said to them, Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man yielded an abundant harvest. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store my surplus of grain. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of grain laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with whoever stores up things for themselves, but is not rich toward God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, o Lord Christ. Please be seated for the singing of the next hymn.
God the Father, the lavish love of God the Son, and the comforting communion of God the Holy Spirit be and abide with you all. Amen. God's word for our Ash Wednesday meditation is from the Old Testament book of Job, reading verses from chapters 40 and 42. The Lord said to Job, Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. Then Job replied to the Lord, I know that you can do all things. No purpose of yours can be thwarted. You asked, Who is this that obscures my plans without knowledge? Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. You said, Listen now, and I will speak. I will question you, and you shall answer me. My ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dush and ashes. The word of the Lord. In the name of our Lenten Lord Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends, accusations, they can be painful. They can sap the strength and the joy out of our hearts, especially when those accusations aren't true, and yet they abound. And think of the power those accusations have. Great leaders of the world have been brought down by accusations that are not true. Great leaders in the church have been brought down by accusations that were not true. But once they were spoken, the damage was done. A man named Job knew the pain of accusations. Do you recall the story of Job? Job was a pious man, lived about the time of the patriarch Abraham, 2000 BC or so. God described him as a righteous man, but perhaps you know what happened to him. Satan appeared before the Lord and asked the Lord to be able to tempt or test Job, and God put a limit on it. He said, okay, but don't lay a finger on Job, and you know what happened. Within a short amount of time, all of his camels, all of his donkeys, all of his sheep, all of his goats died, stolen, gone. And along with them, the servants who tended them, about 10,000 casualties in a very short amount of time. But the worst was yet to come. Job's seven sons and three daughters were enjoying time together in, in a house feasting with one another, and a wind swept in and collapsed the walls of the house, and they all died in an instant. If you were in Job's shoes, what would you do? Job tore his robe, shaved his head as a sign of mourning, and then the text says at the end of chapter 1 of Job, he fell to the ground in worship and uttered these well-known words. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. He was devastated on the ground, as low as he could go. And yet scripture says in all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. But maybe you're aware that his ordeal wasn't over. The Lord allowed Satan now to place a finger on Job, to afflict Job and his health, and he was covered with boils that appeared on his skin, literally from the bottoms of his feet to the top of his head. There was no relief. He was in constant pain, whether he stood up, sat down, or lay down in his bed. The only relief he could find, if you'd call it that, was to take a broken piece of pottery and to scrape the boils and let them fester. Incredible pain. Maybe you've experienced something like this as well. And the people you count on don't much help at first. Job's wife, her first reaction was this, curse God and, jo and die. But Job's reaction was instead, shall we accept good from God and not trouble? Do you know what that's like? Being hit by one problem after another, they come like waves. Maybe it's a financial situation or maybe it's a health situation like it was with Job. Maybe it's a relationship situation, an employment situation. Whatever it is, it doesn't end. And, and they pile up. They keep coming at you. And you're frustrated. And you wonder why. And at times like these, friends can help. The book of Job tells us that Job's friends arrived, and for the next few days, they sat there in silence. 
They said nothing, but in a way that's helpful. What do you say in a situation like that where he's lost everything but his wife, his income, his bank account, his retirement, the inheritance he was going to give to his children, the children to whom he was going to give an inheritance, they're gone. What do you say to a person like that? Silence is about the only thing. But eventually they did speak, but it just made matters worse. You see, in their way of thinking, there's only one reason Job would be suffering this much, and that's because he has done something terribly wrong against the Lord. He had committed some grievous sin, and now God was punishing him. And so they confronted Job. And when Job defended himself, no, I haven't done anything like that. He never said he was not sinless, but he never said, I've never done anything so grievous as to ex receive all of this. His friend said, now you add upon your sin this one too, that you refuse to recognize it. You're gonna hide your transgression. Incredible. 38 chapters of Job, we listen to his friends tell him he's done something wrong, and Job replied, no, I haven't, not anything that deserves this. But after a while, at points, things start to resonate with Job. He begins to question his relationship with God. And even though Job never lost his faith during this entire ordeal, even though he never despaired and cursed God, he still had his doubts. He still had his sinful questions. Like, why did this happen? Why me, Lord? What do you have against me? Please tell me if you know. I need an answer. And that's exactly where Satan wanted him in this ordeal. You see Satan, that name means the accuser. He's doing exactly what he loves to do. And he's great at it. When we're in that situation where hardships arise and they keep coming at us, he wants to accuse. And at first he wants to, us to accuse God. God, why are you doing this? And then he ca causes it to become even more personal. Why are you doing this to me? That's what Job was feeling. Lord, what have I done? How can this have happened? What possibly could I have done to make you so angry with me, to cause you not just to pound, get a pound of flesh out of me, but everything I have is gone. And Job thought God was at fault. Now maybe you've never charged God, maybe you've never accused God with wrongdoing. But our attitudes and our emotions betray an accusation, don't they? Our complaints, our criticisms, our impatience, our sinful anger. Aren't they the product of accusing God of some wrongdoing? It's as if we're putting God on trial. We're saying, okay, God, what do you have against me? We want God to stand there and to speak to us and tell us exactly what he has against us. And that's what Job was asking for. And so God spoke. Listen to what he said. After letting Job and his friends go on for 38 chapters, this is what the Lord said to Job. Will the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? Let him who accuses God answer him. I'll ask the questions, God said. And then he goes on. Where were you when I made the universe? Were you there when I put boundaries on the seas and hung the stars in their places? Who brings the rain and the snow and the lightning? Job, you've gone too far. And that's when Job was brought to his spiritual senses, as you heard in our text. Surely I spoke of things I did not understand, things too wonderful for me to know. I repent in dust and ashes. The Lord put Job in his place. The very place he needed to be most of all. The place of repentance. When we accuse God, we have it backwards. 
we're accusing God of doing something wrong against us when the truth is we've done something wrong which deserves God's eternal condemnation of us. And his question isn't just what makes you think you know better than I do. His question is, why shouldn't I destroy you eternally after what you've done? Even the smallest of sin, one of them deserves God's condemnation. So God calls us to repentance, and he does that so acutely on this evening, this Ash Wednesday. It is by far the most penitential service, the most penitential day on the Christian calendar. He calls us to repentance. He speaks to us through his word. And sometimes that word comes through a spouse who gathers up enough courage to confront us with what we have said or done or have failed to do. Sometimes it comes in the form of a, of a relative, a parent to an adult child or an adult child to a parent. Sometimes it comes in the form of a teacher or a pastor. We're called to account for what we have said or done, what we have thought or felt and have made that known. It is a violation of God's holy will and it deserves damnation and our God is calling us to repent as we did at the beginning of our service. And so we hear his words and we do tonight as Job did. We repent in dust and ashes. And through Job, God announces our forgiveness. You see, this wasn't the end of the story. Although Job accused God of sinning against him, of unjustly treating him, Job never lost his faith. I mentioned that. And in fact, in the middle of the book of Job are in some of the most famous words Job ever spoke. The words we celebrate often at Easter, when Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives, and that in the end he will stand on the earth, and after my skin has been destroyed, yet in my flesh I will see God. In all of this, the hope, the promise of a Redeemer sustained Job. Job didn't know him by name. You do. His name is Jesus. During these Lenten services, we're going to watch God on trial. And we'll see Jesus on trial before Caiaphas, the high priest, before Pontius Pilate. We'll see him accused by his fellow countrymen who will viciously cry out against him, crucify him, crucify him, although he had done nothing wrong. And his enemies admitted it. They had to make things up about him, and yet he took those accusations, as unjust as they were, he took them on himself. And he went all the way to Calvary's cross with them. In fact, what he did was take Satan's accusations against you and God's accusations against you, which are absolutely true, and he went to the cross for them as well. And all those accusations went silent there on Good Friday. Silenced before the Holy God who accepted the sacrifice of his son for the sins of the whole world, for your sins. The accusations are gone. What we have just confessed before our God is gone as far as the East is from the West. God on trial, went to the cross, took Job's accusations with him, took yours and mine too. That's the truth we celebrate in this Lenten season. So when you suffer and the pain seems unrelenting, when you suffer and you can't figure out any good reason why it should be happening, in fact, you can come up with all sorts of reasons why you should not be the one suffering, but somebody else should, Remember Job. More importantly, remember God's response to Job. He did not condemn Job to hell, even though Job accused him, even though Job demanded to speak with God. 
to listen to God's accusations against him, God was merciful. And he was just. Because the justice that Job deserved, that you and I deserve, our God meted out on his son, Jesus Christ. God on trial, accused for us, for the whole world. He is your redeemer, and now he lives. He stands beside you. And every time your accusing conscience bothers you, he reminds you of the sacrifice he made for you. Every time someone unjustly accuses you, he reminds you, no, I'm the one who is your holiness. I am your righteousness. I know, I see, I act. Always in love and always in justice. So my good friends, there's no need to despair. No need to accuse. No need to really understand what God is doing and why. Because we already have his greatest answer. It's in his son, our redeemer, Jesus Christ. The one who lived and died and rose again for you. Your accusations are gone. May the name of the Lord be praised. Amen. Please stand. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Amen. Please be seated for the offering. Even though the offering plates will not be passed, please use the next minute or so as the music plays to recall the goodness of God to you, chiefly in his Son, your Savior. of love, my Savior, bind me to you forever. I am no longer mine. To you I gladly tender all that my life can render and all I have to you resign. Amen. Please stand for prayer. We join in the Ash Wednesday prayer for the church. Holy and righteous God, as we begin again the solemn spiritual journey of Lent, we come before you in deep humility. We confess that we are sinners, both by the nature we inherit and by the th sinful thoughts and desires, words and actions that nature produces. Because of our sins, we deserve only your wrath and punishment. Yet you reveal yourself, not only as a God of holiness and justice, but also as a God of mercy and love. Despairing of our own merits and worthiness, and in response to your gracious invitation, we come pleading for your forgiveness. Lord, have mercy on us for your holy name's sake. You have revealed your love and mercy for us sinners in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. You sent him into our world to be the atoning sacrifice for the sins of all people. Help us grasp by faith the great truth that the pain and suffering, the mockery and ridicule, and the death and punishment he endured should have been ours. Help us understand that in love that is incomprehensible, he suffered and died for us. Lord, have mercy on us for Jesus' sake. In silent meditation, let us reflect on our sins. Praise our Savior for the forgiveness he has won for us and ask for God's continued grace to remove any doubt that we are forgiven.
God of grace and mercy, may your spirit continue to be with us as we follow the way of the cross. As we contemplate the story of our Savior's passion, build us up in our faith. Renew in us the zeal to serve you by reflecting your love in our lives. Give us the desire and the ability to boldly proclaim the grace in which we stand, so that all for whom you lived and died may join us in fellowship now and in your presence forever. We offer our humble thanks and praise, our prayers and petitions, and ourselves in body and spirit to you, Lord God. Hear us according to your promise, for Jesus' sake, amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We continue with the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give Him thanks and praise. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Oh. supper he took the cup and when he had given thanks he gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this cup is the new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always Amen.
Christ. Take another death for us. Take another death.
is the true body of the Savior Jesus Christ, giving you the death of your sins. Please stand. We conclude our worship with the this dialogue on page 12 of your worship folder. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Please be seated for the closing hymn.
so good to see so many of you this evening, especially those of you who are visiting with us tonight. It's a pleasure for me to share that gospel message of Christ, the Redeemer, the one who took our accusations upon himself with all of you. If I haven't yet met you, I'd love to have the opportunity in the Narthos. Recall, once again, we have uh, worship uh, next Wednesday when we'll begin a reading of the Passion History of Our Savior. In other words, during the next five Wednesday evenings, we'll go from the upper room on Thursday evening with our Lord to Calvary's Cross on Friday. Join us next Wednesday, 7 o'clock. But again, the food was awesome. 6 o'clock if you like some, some excellent food. Have a blessed evening.